Yeah, yeah. And, um, Hi there, folks. Welcome to the Park Historical Museum. I'm very, very happy to be able to host this next round of our Saturday Speaker Series featuring the work of Diana Schoenfeld, who has traveled not only throughout Humboldt County, but the United States to photograph and record the history of one-room schoolhouses. It's a really wonderful program that she's put together, and she's spent a long time gathering up not only the oral histories, but all the photographs that you're going to see today. She's an amazing photographer, and I hope that you enjoyed this. I do want to plug both of our sponsors for Saturday's speaker, Carl Johnson Company and the Cutting Edge Hair Salon. Thank you very much for making this series possible with Dr. support. We would not be able to have this be a free admission event. I'd also like to thank the Humboldt County Historical Society and the Humboldt County Library for their participation in making this speaker series possible, as well as Jay Tillman, the man behind our camera today, for all of you folks at home that are watching. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Diana Schoenfeld, who's going to share all kinds of great history with us today. Thank you. Okay. Let's see, let's see. A quick, just the. Um Space bar, you said, right? Of course. Let's get over here. Oh, thank you. I've got the little. Oh. Let's get, now, is this going to. Can you hear me? Yes? You all can hear me. Okay. Okay. What we have here is just a um, photograph of a card, a, a, an announcement to the exhibition of this project that was hosted by the Morris Graves Museum of Art back in 2011. That's a long time ago, really. But because that was such an exhausting, huge project, I had to do other things at the conclusion of that. And other things started to happen in life that took me into new territories and such. But um, to, just so you'll see how I conceived this, it's the idea ex of exploring remote locations. I call them ghost schools, which is appealing to all kinds of people, especially children. And the idea of the voices from the past coming forward both in people I meet who love to talk about these places when they discover that's what I'm looking for, and also the um, journey into literature and other obscure things that I have found, which has just enriched my own imagination about all of this. Um, people have asked, how do I go back? Click with this. There we go. People ask, well, how did this start? How did you, why did you decide to do this? And I have a variety of starting points, um, which over a period of years weave together and continue to shift and change. But I have two th things that are very um, meaningful. One of them has to do with memory from childhood, where my mother would tell me when I was a little girl that she had been a one-room school teacher in the plains of northeastern Colorado, which was cold and lonely and stark and hostile as an environment. And I remember that physical sensation that she expressed in, in reminding me of what she had done when she was a um, school teacher in the, uh, the era of the um, Second World War. And then, of course, the Eel River Schoolhouse. Some of you may know the Eel River Schoolhouse, which is one of ours in Humboldt County. It's out on Cannibal Island Road, another bizarre name for a road, and a lot of the schoolhouses have strange names, too. But um, of that place had been there, of course, since the 1880s. And when I first moved to Humboldt County to teach at College of the Redwoods, um, people began to point me, because I was living on Table Bluff, and, and they said, hey, there's an old schoolhouse out there near, near Lolita. You should, you should go see it. And everyone thinks you're a photographer. Of course, you're going to photograph it, right? Well, I couldn't comprehend how to deal with that, because it was such a stark, really plain. It was vastly different from anything I was doing photographically. But it's always stayed in my mind and sort of haunted me for a long time. And then little by little, I um, began teaching in different universities and coming and going and such. And there was a point where I came back from a journey where I was extremely active and mingling with students and very busy, busy, busy with exciting intellectual things. And it's the exact opposite of what happens when I come home to Table Bluff, where I'm alone with the trees. And I realized that this loneliness 
that I was feeling was beginning to be a burden to me. I, I didn't know what to do with it. And I sat around outside one, one day thinking about it. Why am I doing this? Why am I so far from the mainstream? What can an artist do isolated like this? And slowly it began to creep into my mind, well, what's a lonely subject matter that I can use to bring my own state of mind into a creative project. And coincidentally, I'd been asked to be part of something called the California Arts Project, which is where a lot of teachers come together to teach teachers um, who mostly are doing elementary and middle school. And I got invited to be the visual arts person on a team of teachers. And suddenly, I was meeting people, real living humans, who were in remote locations, especially in Northern California. So little by little, I thought, why not find out what is the equivalent of contemporary one-room school teaching that would have been what I hear, oops, what I he heard about in the frontier American stories. So um, I'll go back. There we go. Here we go, Charlie Pedrozini. So um, little by little, I thought, I will talk to these contemporary teachers. And I began to discover them all over the place, really, especially in Northern California, and invited myself to go there, <laughs> see what they're doing out in obscure places like French Gulch and Burnt Ranch and a variety of places, even mineral as far as the Lassen Park area. And when I went out there, I was photographing the children and doing projects and such, and what I discovered is they said, well, we have an old schoolhouse. You need to photograph that old one instead of the contemporary one. So that got me onto this whole journey of how do I find the old original ones and then collect the stories that go from the minds of people who are currently in those locations as well as have memories from the past or who were former teachers or even students back in the day when those schools were actually functioning. So what you see here is Charlie Pedrozini. He was alive in, two, this is about 2000 when I took this picture. That's the Eel River Schoolhouse. And um, what I did was a big project with one of my former students at, who was, became a teacher at Lolita Elementary. And we turned this experience of bringing the children to the schoolhouse with my big old camera here. You see this view camera here? which is what I decided to use. And we turned this into an adventure in learning about the year 2000 and the old cameras and a daguerreotype, which was an early, early example of photography, and making a group portrait and letting the kids look under the black cloth and see what it looked like, you know. And then we um, got together with the um, st former students of Canal School who had never been together for 50 years. And they all came together to meet these kids. Anyway, it went into like this whole series of projects, different comings and goings, but it was a wonderful experience. And uh, there were several of other of those kind of um, situations that I, over time, was able to do with different students, like out in Mineral was one place. That's near Lassen. This I wanted to point out, because we're dealing with, I'm dealing with the crisis of digital and this new world of technology, which I didn't, I wasn't born into and I don't really feel comfortable with. But I had been using that camera for 10 years it makes a five by seven inch negative sheet film or four by five inches if you use a different holder. And I just um, was devoted to that. It's very slow. It reduces how many pictures you take considerably and it results in magnificent detail. You know, we're talking about resolution in these days, but beautiful uh, results. Okay, so moving along, you've got the general idea. I met uh, this woman. People learned what I was doing. They said, you've got to meet Nor Nyla Morrison. She was in her, gosh, she must have been in her 80s then. She had been a teacher at the um, Cape Town School. Oops. Now what have I done? And I decided to take her back to the Cape Town School. I thought I had a, I might have jumped. There we go. I took her back to this schoolhouse and we had a picnic and I wanted to see what she would tell me about her thoughts of returning. She'd been there as a girl, horseback riding, coming and going. She'd done a teaching credential at HSU at that time. This is the 1920s. 
And she went into that building, and I've written essays about this. She picked up the chalk and began to write her name on the chalkboard again. It was just so touching. So we did a series of <clears throat> pictures of her, and, and there she is close up, and then um, with her hands holding an old antique book, a poem, poems teachers ask for. And each of these situations, there are more photographs than I could ever show. You know, Here's one of Esther Piferini, who was a former student up at the Canal School, which is outside of Arcata on Jane's Road. You go way up that way. And um, this is a fantastic um, archive <clears throat> for our county. She and her sister, Hazel, were two young kids who went to that school. And their, they, their family, the two women have passed away now, but I have both of their long stories that I transcribed. And they're, um, I guess they're the aunt, the aunt of Paul, um, Paul um, Gentoli. You know the name, Gentoli? Well, this is this old homesteading bunch, you know, from the past. And he has the entire archive of everything relating to that school. Letters of application to 19, from 1913, everything you can imagine, boxes of it, the children's artwork, incredible. So I'm saying, what are we going to, you've got to archive that somewhere, maybe here. It's, it's intact. So I'm hoping that can go forward. Here, you know, I'm touching something wrong by my finger by accidentally. I don't want to be there. What have I done? My knuckle touched something by accident. I need to go backwards. Oh, that's a scrolling thing there, huh? Go all the way back. You're going forward. Oh, am I going forward? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Slide, go on up. Right, go, go right to our next, next one. That one there, number nine. nine. Thank you. Now, what did I do? I didn't know that was, oh, I was touching that by accident. Go. I just, um, We'll go back to the woman in front of us, the schoolhouse. No, you're forward. You want to go, you go scroll up. Sorry, the, like, it, That's good, right there. This one right here. Now, all I need to do is not touch <laughs> the wrong I surface. Get it to play from the other. Here, just play slide show. Okay. Sorry, I'm usually using PowerPoint, and this is Google Slides, so. Watch over there. Where are we? Is that right? So I don't want to start from the beginning. No. Um. See, this is the problem. I don't know mm -hmm. what my fingers are even doing, you know, accidentally. Well, I can, once we get it going, I can just forward the slide for you. Um. So I just want. Yeah. You I just, I just wanted to bring the beginning of this so you'll get a feel for how this started and how I was working with actual humans in this. It wasn't just like going out and photographing these empty, cold, leftover buildings, but really interacting with the history of memory. And um, it became fascinating. And so I began just taking field notes everywhere I went. People would talk to me and tell me this and that. And they would always point me, oh, you've got to go find that one out there. Or you go here and you'll find another one. So it became this uh, journey exploring. And it wasn't, as time went by, it wasn't like um, easy 100%. It was getting off the beaten track. And, and it was um, sometimes it would take me 10 years between hearing a reference to a place and actually finding it, even here in Humboldt County. Have you got it? Yeah. So all I do is what? You want me to touch that? Yes. There we go. Okay. So, so to bring it into physical reality, you see here are the schoolhouse memoirs. This is the way I write these things up, and they each have a heading. And I use a quote, which is the, in the style of speech of the person that the story is telling, and it um, usually has something... Um, unique and interesting and colorful about this. Mm -hmm. Any location on that or just? I can do it. For okay, you. okay. Here's a closer up version of one. So you can see Darlene Whiting, who was my neighbor. She has the incredible life story of having been part of a family that was the, one of the settler families up in the um, Neeland area, but farther away. And she went to a one-room log cabin schoolhouse 
which only had four, I think in those days you had to have four in a fraction, or five, I think it was four, or five in a fraction students, meaning a minimum of five or four kids who would be regular students, guaranteeing that another one would come when the time, when he was allowed to get away from the, doing the land, the work on the land. And that would be the only way you could get a teacher to come in these far remote locations and be paid. And then where would she stay and all this? But this is a very colorful story. And um, so then as time went on, um, and none of this is chronological. First, I have to tell you, it's not chronological historically. It's not chronological in terms of my journeys. Um, and I've categorized groupings of the photographs to give a little bit of coherence. But it's like what an odyssey is, is an, a journey with, no, with an uncertain outcome. You never know for sure you know, what you're going to find or where you're going. This is Lassie Woody, a woman I met in Asheville, North Carolina. I had, needed, I had been at Ohio State University teaching for a full school year as an art, invited artist. And then my sister started to die. And I suddenly had to come down to North Carolina to be with parts of the family to go through this process of what's going to happen to my sister. But in the process of that, I set up a really primitive little dark room in my uncle's basement and began to explore um, the, the schoolhouses in a part of the country I never thought I would be doing that in. I thought I was going to be out west when I think of, you know, the western American states. Having been from Georgia, I have a very definite sense of different parts of the country. But I'm back there, and um, as time went on, my sister passed away, and then I came back from Florida where this was happening, and back in Asheville, North Carolina, and people said, you've got to go find this woman with the one-room log cabin schoolhouse. And sure enough, I did. You can move forward now. Mm -hmm. There she is inside. And I wish we could see this better, but you can look in these notebooks as well later. And she had preserved this one-room schoolhouse that had been built by her ancestors in an east, farther eastern part of the, the state and moved it peg by peg over to her place where she had finally ended up living. And she had all of these artifacts from the past that were part of it, including these scrolls. These were reading scrolls. Go ahead and keep clicking on this, yeah. And you'll see another version of the way it's positioned in the, in the room. There's the stone fireplace. You can click again. And then the old school books. It was full of this kind of thing. And as time went on, I was back and forth for various reasons and became fast friends with her. And one day I asked her if I could photograph uh, the school books, move them out to the front and begin to photograph them, keep going. And um, this is where, when I began to think the school books would be a wonderful subject matter unto themselves. And as time went on, keep going. As time went on, I remember she's getting pretty old and such, and uh, she said, look, I want to give you all of these old school books and everything else in here that's ephemera, because I know you'll be able to use them with your schoolhouse project. So all of these books, I itemized them and I sent them back, and now in, in Lolita, I had all these boxes of these antique school books. And continue. So um, as time went on, I began to make them as still life arrangements, and I brought a notebook in which you can flip through and just see a whole bunch of what I found and how I photographed them. This is Lassie on the right. The woman on her left is her teacher from the old days when she was a teacher in the 20s, and Lassie was a little girl. And then I got the stories from both of them. Keep going. And here is the um, teacher holding a snapshot of herself with her students back in the 20s. So it was just this incredible connection. OK, keep going. <laughs> and then what happened? Well, Lassie died. And a month or two later, her family called me and said, Diana, the schoolhouse caught on fire. And everything we had in that place burned, except for the walls. If you hadn't made all these photographs, we would have nothing left. So I'm just deeply touched by all of this, of course, and went back later to photograph the walls. So I have a whole set of the pictures of pictures of just the way it looks without anything in it. Keep going. That's a sample. And then it's a close-up of these reading scrolls, which were typical um, in the day back to the 1880s and what have you. OK, keep going. And I found, OK, so about log cabins, I have sort of a subcategory as time went on. This is one up in Oregon, in Kirby. Some of you may have noticed as you drive north, there's a place called Kirbyville. Mm -hmm. And there's a little schoolhouse there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of under a roof 
Now, I don't know what the status of it is now. It's so fragile. But they've been protecting it, and it's one of the most adorable things. It's very tiny, and even the dust is intact in there. So here's the cardboard blackboard. Keep going. And um, you'll see some more in here of that. So this, um, some interiors, uh, we have a log cabin schoolhouse in Humboldt County. The um, owner of it asked me to not publicize it very much. So I usually just call it a Redwood Log Schoolhouse. Some of you might know about it, but she has reasons to want to keep it less than um, a big deal. But anyway, I made many photographs of it. And these certificates and various things, her school logs are painted white inside, which makes it more brilliant. We'll keep going. And then here's some samples again of these scrolls that roll down that were used for educational purposes, lessons and stuff. You can see the scroll on the top and such. Okay, keep going. And here is my mother. Back in the day, she went to that place in, 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 in northeastern Colorado that was called Gary School. I didn't find this until after she died and I was going through her estate and all her papers. And I found the snapshot of Gary School and the date on the back her Colorado Special War Emergency Certificate for Teaching. It was just uncanny because I'd heard the story, but I hadn't known any evidence, physical evidence. Okay, go ahead. Here's Matol. Um, it doesn't look much like a schoolhouse, but it is the second school in Petrolia. I did some research just for this talk, um, and it, it now, um, it was built in 1862, but an earlier one there. Matol Union School District, they call it. But the first building says, what, 1859, okay. I think that's where it is. Here is one of ours, Seward Schoolhouse. Anyone been out there? Yeah, you've seen it? It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Okay, keep going. And I have many different views of that. Here's one of our preserved ones, the Garfield School. And here is the um, Excelsior Schoolhouse. Anyone seen Excelsior Schoolhouse? <coughs> It's pretty obscure, but this is a vantage point looking down on it. And you can see it's missing its belfry. Um, the fellow who owns it, I mean, this goes back to whenever I photographed this 10 years ago or something, but he said he thinks he knows where that original bell is somewhere. It's been preserved. Okay, keep going. Let's move along. This is Iquay School, and Iquay School no longer stands. It's up in the area that you find as you drive from Neyland, you drive up and over and around and you're coming down towards Bridgeville again. It's on that one of those long roads that connects them. It's gone. And uh, the next one is the interior, as I found it, with the collapsed chimney, the bricks. And then um, this one is the um, Buck Mountain Schoolhouse, which is out um, on a ranch. And I have several views of this. Continue. This is, these are definite ghost schools, in my opinion, and uh, very melancholy mood to these pictures. Okay, keep going. And does anyone know where this is? Does this look familiar? This is Showers Pass. Ever hear of it? This is one of the most remote spots. You get up there and you hear about children in those days walking many miles to get to their one-room schoolhouses all over the country. <clears throat> Here's a great example of the expanse of landscape where these places were positioned. And those are two schoolhouses. Um, Keep going. And here's one of them alone. This would be the second schoolhouse. And then the first, keep going. Um, there are the two of them together. The first one was like a log cabin in the far back. Keep going. And that is what the log cabin one looks like when I photographed it. And this is the way the front of the one that became the second. Then there was a third one, which I think was in a different location. That's okay. <coughs> I found some more information about this just last week, this, the Showers Pass story. Um, but anyway, you, it's an incredible, incredible journey up there. And to think about that, um, those times. And my most recent information that came to me was from a, one of my former students who said she had collected information about her mother's childhood at, what's the name of that place? called Yager Valley Schoolhouse, and how they had, her mother was a teacher, and her mother had created a way for them to have a library in the living room. And this library from Humboldt County would bring books to them, and then people in the area could borrow books from their house. 
that's, I've heard of those kinds of things in, the, in other stories as well. We better keep going along here. Um, <clears throat> this is a newer discovery for me too. A number of years ago, someone pointed me in this direction and said, oh, there's that old schoolhouse up there. You go out from Fortuna up on School Road or something, and this building is there, and I never did find evidence of it, of the truth of it, until I was down at, in the Fortuna History Library and History um, Museum, and um, Alex confirmed this was the, old, the first Rohnerville School, 1860. And it was moved, apparently. And, and a number of these schools had been moved. Here's a beautiful preserved one in um, Sonoma County. They're beautiful white, you know, some of these are beautiful white painted ones. Keep going now. I think I've got a cluster now of these beautiful white buildings, the kind of thing we want to romanticize. Oh, these beautiful little schoolhouses. They're like toys almost. <coughs> this one's in Oregon. This one is in uh, Tennessee. It's the tiniest thing. This one is also, uh, this is North Carolina. Now what's interesting about this one, I discovered that this building is, at the time I photographed it, how many years ago, I can't remember now, but I have it all documented, actually. I just didn't put it on these slides here. This building is one of the few that everything is intact, meaning all of its original wood on the outside has not been rotted or replaced with that fake wood they use now and it's all perfect was I mean who knows what's happened in the meantime but very pretty little building and it is a uh, used as church now of course yeah. often they are here is our beautiful Blocksburg schoolhouse still in that wonderful geometric s s um, quality to them with the, the bell tower up above and the white paint here is the most adorable thing too. This is Beach, Beach Grove up in um, this Great Smoky Mountains National Park where if you haven't yet gone there in North Carolina in Tennessee you should because it's got an incredible territory called Caves Code which is all the original log cabin architecture from the settlers days still there and this would have been an early uh, schoolhouse but it's not a log cabin. Okay, This is one I discovered by chance, um, down in the area known as Stewart's Point. Does anyone know where that is? It's south of us, down there in uh, Sonoma County. And I looked that up online. A lot more information is now on the internet about all these places, but when I started doing this in 1997, I had never even gone on the internet. So, I mean, a lot has become available to us, even if it's not a huge amount of historic documentation, at least it's a reference like the little one called Blowing Cove back there, the little itty bitty one in Tennessee. I looked that up saying, well, what else can they tell me about it? Well, all they talk about is, is its relationship to the church. They don't mention, oh, and by the way, this happens to, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> and here's one of ours, it's called Redwood Schoolhouse. You find this as you head out of uh, Carlotta area going up toward Bridgeville. And then you continue up there and you get into Showers Pass. It's, uh, it's a long day's adventure. This is no longer standing. Um, this is the interior that I found with the old cardboard blackboard, um, which was very typical in those days. And here is a, a beautiful one in, um, in Log Cabin, perfectly preserved. It was up in Peanut, which is over there in uh, Trinity County. Anyone ever hear of Peanut? The town of Peanut? <laughs> well, it's true. Well, I learned that the Peanut Schoolhouse, which also was known officially as Blanchard School, had been moved down to Hayfork. Anyone been to Hayfork or heard of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a little bit farther toward, but toward 299, a little closer down. And I thought, okay, I better go find this thing. Look at that beautiful little bell tower. When I went in that, from the outside it looked absolutely perfect, just like a toy. I went in and it was trashed. It had been used or brought there to be used as their um, chamber of commerce type building or something like a business, some kids went in there and just tore it up. So these are the sad, mm, I guess you'd call them evolution experiences, evolutionary experiences of the schoolhouses. They come and they go, they get, they get resurrected, then they get forgotten. And that one we have up on Stone Lagoon, you know, the one on the highway going north? Mm -hmm. That's, I've seen evidence of it being 
in perfect condition and then getting run down. And the last time I went in there a few years ago, I said, well, where's all the schoolhouse stuff? And they said, oh, there was a thief. Some sly person was stealing all that stuff. The person who owns the um, RV park there. Mm -hmm. So it, it lost a lot just because of, I don't know. I think that's tragedy, personally. But Here's one over in um, Siskiyou. Too bad you can't see it, but there's a flag up there. The Ameri this is a bell tower. This is called a Callahan School. It's used as a law office now. And here is one of my favorites, even though when I photographed it, I thought, oh, what am I going to do with this? But it turns out that's the Xenia store. If, it's, if it still functions as a store, I don't know. Up out of... Um, Mm, go, uh, Garberville area, you go up toward Alder Point and all there. And this was a stagecoach stop and a supply stop, and it had a schoolroom long ago. And I just love the way it looks all cattywampus like that. You know? And the next one, I hope, is what became later to be the schoolhouse for Xenia, which, as I learned, was is now occasionally used for other purposes, you know, community type things. But it's very, very basic, you know, it's in the woods and it's, they all look very sort of semi-haunted in my opinion. They have that quality of forgottenness and melancholy and a sort of romantic mystery and all of that appeals to me very much as a photographer because you can really enjoy the pictures. Okay. <laughs> Here's one in our area. It's up in Trinity County though. It's called the High and Palm Schoolhouse. Very difficult to photograph this one. Where do you stand? How do you, you know, get a good view of it? But I thought this would give the, the point that it has the bell tower still or when I photographed it and, and all of that. And so I had, here's a lovely one. This is a beautifully well-kept one called Gladdy Fork. And it is um, in um, North Carolina. It looks like it was built back in 1914-15 and the original school house would have dated from 1884. So I began to discover these different generations of the schools or how the buildings have changed or been replaced. That's a beautiful one. Now here's a beauty. Uh, this is one of my really bizarre adventures. In Idaho, I was coming back from a spell up in Montana for a summer session with something called the um, Art Studies in the American West, which was a place a project worked out by a place called the Ohio Wesleyan College where I connected to the man there when I was teaching at Ohio State, as I'd mentioned earlier. And so on that journey, after being in Bozeman for a while, Bozeman, Montana, I decided, well, I'm just going to be out here for a while and take myself with my camping gear up and explore and go up even as far into Glacier National Park and the Continental Divide and Idaho and just see what I can find. And as I was getting down into southern Idaho toward Oregon, I found some reference in maybe it was a AAA, AAA book or something about this place called Silver City, which is a ghost town. It's one of the official ghost towns, but it's also got businesses way up on this steep, twisty, turny, take your life in your hands kind of road. <laughs> and I thought, well, I better go up there because it looks like there's a schoolhouse up there. And I got on this road, and these people on the road, the guys, you know, and they're saying, are you going to be okay? They're coaching me on how to drive my little VW up this incredibly scary. But I got up there, and I took a bunch of views of it. Go ahead and keep going. It's very pretty because it's pure white in the sunlight. And, um, and it, there it is with its lovely little bell tower and such. It, it was called um, Idaho Standard School from 1892. It didn't have a particular name. But it's a good place to go if you ever want to have an adventure. <laughs> and here's the way it looks, the front door and, and all. Um, here's one in New Mexico, which is another front door effect, but it's looking at that adobe um, style building that's typical of that era. And this would have been made with, it would, it would have been made with the adobe bricks or maybe Tyrone. Tyrone, it turns out, is the mud they pull out of the Rio Grande River and they make bricks out of this. I had to research this, which is different from an adobe brick, which has straw and mud and sand and other things mixed in with it. But so much of the architecture in New Mexico is made with the earth, the earthen architecture. And it often has these shapes, of course, which we can recognize. It's a, this was a schoolhouse called, he called it Historic Peralta, not too far out of Albuquerque. And I met the man who was 
renovating it, of course, I was very distressed with that fence in front of it. It didn't have that quality I like of the kind of mm, untouched. But no, he was protecting it. And there were these fierce dogs and everything. But I met the man, and uh, he was a fascinating guy. He was totally um, refurbishing this so it would survive and putting in, rebuilding the original old, um, how do they, they call those fireplaces that come out of the corners of the buildings? Uh, yeah, in the corners, these circular sort of fireplaces. Anyway, he was really making a big effort on this. Uh, it was very interesting. And he showed me inside, and he was living in there, of course, as well. Go ahead. Um, I like the picture a lot, anyway. And here's another one in New Mexico, among others I haven't yet made available to see. But this is, I think, possibly the most remote location I have ever been in. I couldn't, my cell phone wouldn't even connect. And this was in a ghost town area in southwestern New Mexico in what had been the silver mining area in the day. Mm -hmm. And I discover all this by researching as best I can. And I went there looking and went up into this territory. This was on the lower valley. And then I went higher and higher and higher and found all kinds of interesting, um, peculiar evidence of former life up there and some few people still up there. This is. Um, there's no way a photograph can express the feeling you have when you arrive at such a place and you see it standing there in all its, its glory, basically abandoned, you know, yet so dignified in its own way. So continue. I think I've got a front of it next. Um, don't have the front of it. Must have, well, that's interesting. I must have missed, oh well. I've got it in the notebook here. Okay, here is Cross Rock Schoolhouse. This is one of the first ones I found when I was back there in North Carolina. Um, and remember, because I was raised in Atlanta, and we would go to my grandmother's place in North Carolina frequently. We always would drive back up, and we call it, you go to the mountains when you're in the deep south. You go to the mountains to cool off. And um, so it wasn't out of my familiar world. I just hadn't been there in a long time because I'd been you know, out here instead. <laughs> but what's interesting is there's a lot of what I feel that's similar in Humboldt County and the coastal areas here in the hill country that reminds me a lot of North Georgia and um, Western North Carolina. It's the, what they call the Blue, the Blue Ridge Parkway or the Smoky Mountains. It's the mist, it's the haze, it's the fog, it's that atmospheric quality that we have here that can, you know, drive us nuts occasionally. But it's part of that world, and um, you can see a little bit of the effect of it. This is a beautiful one that I found, Cross Rock. Keep going. And um, I met the man, of course. Here's a beautiful view of it from the, the back side of it. And he, had, he took me inside, and he showed me, and I have other pictures in other, of the walls of that building when it had been a school were just planks, but they had painted them black. Right on the walls were the chalkboards. And, and he had turned it into a tobacco drying farm, uh, drying um, barn. Here is another really nifty one, which is preserved in a little park. It's called the Historic Sam Houston Schoolhouse. And um, you've heard of Sam Houston, maybe? Maybe not. Okay, Sam Houston was from Tennessee. You've heard of Davy Crockett? <laughs> you've heard of Daniel Boone? You've heard of... Um, mm, What's his name, Travis? Uh, you've heard of Austin, Stephen Austin. This is a whole bunch of these people who came down from the mountains in Tennessee. And they all went down into Texas, and they became part of that whole Texas Revolution, breaking free from Mexico. And you've heard of the Alamo and the big fight. And da, da, da. Well, anyway, these are American cultural heroes from that part of the country. And um, Sam Houston left his name on this schoolhouse because he taught there for a while. But he ended up down, and you think of Houston, Texas, right? You think of Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. You think of um, um, Travis. There's a guy named Travis at Travis Air Force Base, is it right? Mm -hmm. There are these names that all come from these mountains, you know, Appalachia down into this country. But this is a beautiful, darling place. Continue. And I um, have, this is in one of the interiors of the teacher's desk and the mantle and such. And there are intriguing aspects of this I don't have in this show, but. Go back to the one just before that. Mm -hmm. These windows, oops, oh, I see what it you're doing. Like okay, back. see, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> well, see the windows, how they're long there? 
the horizontal windows. Um, schoolhouses often just had windows on one side to bring in the light. But this was so clever, they had these systems where those windows had a way to, the coverings could fold down and become like a little platform for the kids to put their books on. And they would have stools, and then they could fold that up and close the windows that way. Very nifty, you know? I thought it was <laughs> very uh, interesting to see. Okay, keep going. <laughs> and there, can you go forward? Yeah. Okay. This, uh, there are many stories I could tell about my discovery of this place, which was one of the first places I found that was really totally overtaken by suburbia. But it had been maintained as a little park. And the fellow there and I got into a long conversation and he was talking about the spirits of the history of those woods. They call them woods over there, a forest, um, more woods, but how they, Sam Houston often would revisit, the spirit of Sam Houston would revisit in the form of a white owl when some kind of upheaval was going to happen or was happening in the, in the environment. This is a really old one. I put it in here because it's part of the earlier phases, even though it's in a different, totally different style being stone or some kind of brick um, in North Carolina. What does it say? It says 1837 down there. Mm -hmm. I think there had been an earlier, yeah, the earlier, there had been an earlier one. But then I put up here this particular statement I found. I thought, this is a good place to put in the fact that in 1635, Boston... Oh, good, I can read that. Boston Latin School, the first public school in the United States, 1635, was founded the oldest school still in existence in this country and still requires its students to study four years of Latin. So I love getting that starting point in, in that way for this whole journey of mine. Okay. <laughs> Here's the, uh, another lo the log cabins that I found in North Carolina. And I've got the stories of the people there, and it was built by teenagers back in the Depression. Mm -hmm. They cut down the logs, and it's a whole journey of stories involved in this one. Keep going. I'm just going to have to speed up a little bit here. That was inside the building, and this is um, a, a school certificate from an entirely different state, but somehow it found its way into that log cabin. Okay, keep going. Now we're going to talk about something extremely interesting to me and I think very important. That little building there with that wall of windows, which is very typical of those schoolhouses, um, it was pointed out to me, and I went, keep going, and I found this gentleman here, this black guy, in a town of Weaverville, which is the outskirts of which is where my grandmother had a little cabin. It's part of why I was going back to my childhood in a way. Well, this was Weaverville Colored Elementary School, which we would never call it that these, in this day and age, but that was... That was the way it was. And this was one of the former pupils and how he and his other remaining former students were trying to discover, was this an original Rosenwald school? Keep going. You might wonder, well, what is a Rosenwald school? And I've got a whole story about that in here. There is one of my favorite discoveries, the Mars Hill Colored Elementary, also in North Carolina, very close to the other one. Overtaken by the woods, as you see, there's the window wall completely encroached upon. Keep going. And when I photographed it, this is what I found, these re remainders of it. Keep going. And I met a woman named Sarah, and she was a student there, and I got her whole story. Keep going. And what I began to learn was that these schools, which were called Rosenwald schools, at that point in time were beginning to become a new, big, gigantic research project. Now, I'm going to try to compress this, but... There was a man named Booker T. Washington. He wrote a book called Up From Slavery. He, was, um, he came out of slavery in Virginia, and then he made his way to a place called the Hampton Institute. A lot of this is in that case over there. And he ended up um, becoming well-educated. He, he was then a teacher. The Hampton Institute was devoted to educating black kids and Native American kids, mostly black, in Virginia, turn of the century and earlier. 1900 I'm talking about. And so Booker T. Washington does some teaching, and then he gets invited to go down to Alabama and start up an educational program for uh, adult black citizens. And I've got a story about teaching in a hen house. 
over here, the primitive conditions that he was working with. But that man created what has become as the very famous Tuskegee Institute. Now it's Tuskegee in, uh, uh, University and it's devoted to black Americans in higher education. Well, to go back to 1913 now, um, he decided not only to create this higher education for older people, he said, we gotta build little bitty schoolhouses ourselves for our black kids here because the US government isn't gonna do it for us. So let's do it ourselves, self-sufficiency, the whole thing, we can do it. Labor, land, you know, we'll just create schools. So he started doing that and it became known to this man up in Chicago by the name of Julius Rosenwald. There's the name. Rosenwald was the CEO of Sears Roebuck at that time. I won't tell you his story, it's very interesting, but he said, hey, I really like what I'm hearing about this guy, Booker T. Washington, down there in the South. I appreciate the self-sufficiency philosophy he has. I'm gonna go see this. To make a long story short, he goes down there to Alabama and he says, I'd like to start some seed money. So he puts $300 in to start a school and the black people all get together and within months, a whole bunch more, like eight more schools get built. And Rosenwald's so impressed and he's got lots of money anyway. He's a philanthropist, a Jewish philanthropist. He's a designer of men's clothing. Uh, he transformed Sears Roebuck. There's a lot I learned about all this, but the point is, he said, let's make a, a, a partnership here. Let's make a, a foundation. Let's make a way to where I can support this effort on your part. So little by little, he said, you gotta, you gotta conform to a few things. You've gotta have good lighting, good sanitation, seats and desks and chairs. You have to have a series of responsible, minimal requirements. I don't care what the school looks like, but you've gotta provide these, these things for the, the kids. And it could be a two room school with one teacher. And anyway, the idea is over time, these schoolhouses became so well done by the kids, the adult kids t who were at, at Tuskegee Institute were now becoming, you know, making blueprints, that the white communities said, hey, we want your, your Rosenwald blueprints for our kids too. Can we have some? So this whole segregation thing, remember, back in the Deep South, remember? That's where I'm from. I can remember all this. So Mallard Creek Schoolhouse, look at that interesting shape there. That was one of the Rosenwald schools that was built for white community. So the idea now to look into this, you can find oodles of information on the web. It's incredible. There are over 5,000 of these Rosenwald schools that were built and little by little they are beginning to be rediscovered that had fallen into ruin or turned into something else, different purposes. But to rediscover their identity is just this wonderful footnote to American history and the story of how that all came to be. Now, the thing that's sad about this is, watching, is um, er, um, Booker T. Washington, who began all this, he died from the time of, two, of 1913. He was dead by November of, two, of 1915. But Rosenwald continued, you see, on his own. So that's why it has the name, and it, go, keep going on this. It's really fascinating to me, and these old school houses, the Rosenwald Connection, go all the way out into Texas and all the way up into Maryland and Florida to Oklahoma. I just happened to stumble into, and I have in this notebook here, the Rosenwald story and about five pages of other Rosenwalds that I found. Here's one right near where my mother's house was, the old Walnut Grove in, in, in Georgia area. It had been moved to a new location near a historic house, keep going, and a very picturesque setting. Just keep moving along. Here is one of my favorite ghostly pictures with that bell tower in the trees. That's up in Oregon, uncertain if it's Laurelwood or not. Here's a, a wonderful ghostly one in the trees in Arkansas. And keep going. Another one, I've got a series now of these real kind of derelict ghosts to keep that kind of mood going. This is Oklahoma. Keep going. Here's one in Florida, black kids. I don't know anything about this. I just happened to discover it. People said, oh, go take a picture of that one. It's an African-American school. This would have been about, uh, when I took that picture, it might have been 1997, pretty far back. But I don't know anything about it. But I thought it was another example of these itty-bitty little schools with these majestic uh, scenery, trees and such. Here's an interesting one in Montana, a sliding board with, with, with wooden edges. It's just very, very beautiful, picturesque things standing there just 
for how long? I don't know. But it did belong to Maudlow School. Maudlow School. Okay, keep going. Now we're in Montana. Look at that. This is Reese Creek. Beautiful. Very powerful. This is down in uh, Utah. See the adobe brick? That's all made of adobe brick. It was being renovated when I found it. It was also said it's in a ghost town. Here's a beauty in um, Vermont, unidentified, just sitting there looking gl glamorous, but nothing, nothing about it, no information. Here is in Colorado. I did go in 2015, to, for other reasons, to a gallery in Fort Collins, and I decided to stay for a week and drive around northeastern Colorado with the research I'd done on um, the county where my mother had been a school teacher and see what I could find. And I met, in fact, keep going, um, here's, here's what I found. And when I, s it's sort of linked to my mother in a way, but not exactly. When I found this schoolhouse in the landscape, I realized, I said, that is what I've been looking for all these years, that my idea of a frontier schoolhouse is that kind of architecture. Keep going. And there's this front of it. Sorry, these aren't as... If we were in pitch black, this would look better, but you get the idea. Keep going. And here, um, anyway, there's a whole story about what, we, what I did discover about the schoolhouse where Mother had taught came to me by a young woman who was a rancher there. She and her brother were, were ranchers, and she then researched it and sent me, and I've got her little story up there, too, of her, her mother or her grandmother's teaching at a place in mm, Nebraska, which is right adjacent a school called Pronghorn. So these names are pretty interesting, really. This is another one in the Smoky Mountains National Park. These are massive logs, and it's a log cabin schoolhouse. Keep going. I think I have an interior. This is a chalkboard, a blackboard, with um, the um, words taken from Webster's Blue-Backed Speller, which was a famous book that was used. Look at that, 1783. And Webster, you've heard of the Webster Dictionaries, of course. He had decided he wanted to create an American English instead of the British English. So he was readjusting spellings, pronunciations, and all of that. A fascinating uh, thing to know about. And this is called Little Green Bar School, and there's a lot of story that goes into revolving around this place and the family of young women, sisters, called the Walker Sisters, who didn't want to leave when the park was being built. So there was this whole issue of the Smoky Mountains National Park. Are you going to stay or leave with the citizens who'd been there, you know, in the set settling days? Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. But anyway, wonderful example of a log cabin school. And here is uh, another interesting thing, thinking of blackboards and chalkboards and things on the wall. This is, and in the spirit of what's happening today, out of the Joss house. You know on 299? You've been out there? Anyone? Yeah. yeah. Well, you go into their conference room on the side of the temple, and you discover that had been used as a classroom for the Chinese immigrant kids. And that up there is like we would have instructions or the scrolls, cultural values chart, lessons in their cultural values. So I couldn't resist taking a picture of that, yes. even though it moved into a whole other zone, but because I'm thinking along these lines, I thought, It'd be good to bring it in today, and coincidentally, there's this big event happening. Pretty neat. Okay, keep, keep going. Now, here is um, Dry Creek a Schoolhouse out in Colorado. Um, I have a, that's okay, I have a better, I have a beautiful one. Some, well, it's in my other slideshow. I only had the side one there. This is another one in Colorado. Keep going. Here, it, this one I love with the little pump you can see, the mm -hmm. water pump. I do have a whole lot more pictures of interiors and odd, odd, odds and ends, you know, of that sort, but it becomes too much. This is a beautiful story. About, this is an early one, too, 1848. I met the woman whose family, who knew the whole story, and I have it all written down. A very tiny little thing. It's now a church. Here's one from Vermont. It's also very early. What does that say? I'm sorry. I went to That's okay. look at it. And, uh, 32 or 52? Uh, 52. Yeah, another pretty, pretty early one. It's all been transformed now, saved and transformed and moved. So in a way, 
it's like we went back to Mars Hill Colored Elementary, the one with the window wall and all covered up by the branches and inside were those old chairs, school chairs. That one has been totally transformed. In the meantime, they discovered it's a Rosenwald school. They call it Anderson Rosenwald. And it's been all that beauty that I love as a photographer is gone. And instead, now you have this spick and span community center. Mm -hmm. So the building has been restored, but it, it lost that melancholy look that I adore so much. And here's one, it was one of my first discoveries by chance. Uh, as I was traveling across from wherever I was coming back from, Wyoming, Fort Bridger, anyone ever been at, up in that area of the country, Wyoming? Bridger was one of the early uh, um, trappers and um, mountain men, and he had a fort, and um, that was this itty-bitty schoolhouse there, the first one, apparently, in the Wyoming Territory. And at Fort Bridger, you can see old log cabins and all. Here's inside a one in Laramie, Wyoming. This is a log cabin schoolhouse. I had to do it through the windows. And it looks much better in a picture than it does on the screen here. Mm -hmm. But they had these little mittens to wipe their slates with. Keep going. There's another example of that little desk and everything. Here's one in Georgia. This is more of a Victorian sort of style that's been preserved beautifully in Georgia. Here's the old um, plank seesaw made of wood in the yard. Here's a very melancholy one in Tennessee. Oh, the trip to Tennessee was a real adventure, I'll tell you. Oh, gosh. But this one I found, every time I find one of these schools, I think, how am I going to make a picture of this? It is not an easy automatic. I have got to struggle. But this one was painted brilliant red with a high gloss paint. Black and white photographs, you don't worry about that, but still it had that sort of, whoa. But it was just such a sad, melancholy, strange place with a dignity, though, because you can see it had two of these curved, arched entrances with, like, Greek p pillars, mm -hmm. you see? All carved in wood. It's very, if you look at the actual photograph or you blow it up, you can see how rough-hewn it is, almost by hand. It's all been made um, very um, touching, in my opinion. Here's another one that's very sweet. Uh, it's the little Hemp Hill Schoolhouse. It's early again, 1847. And it is in the process at the time I photographed it of being restored um, there, but very tiny. I think that might be the end. Oh, okay. One of our other little ghosts here in Humboldt County. I believe this is one of three Table Bluff schoolhouses, which no longer exist except for this, if it, even if it still is out there on Hookton Road near the new native housing area. Um, and, um, I and I met a man who said he went there. So I'm trusting it's true. Okay, I don't know how much more. Oh, then I, just, then I just end it. So I hope you found that interesting and full of variety and um, a little bit of my enthusiasm, you know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close by reading something here and then I'm gonna turn on the lights and you can, I want you to browse through a lot of this here. How can I? Here, I can see it. Okay. I rediscovered this recently as I was putting all this together. <clears throat> There's a, an Irish poet, philosopher, writer by the name of John O'Donohoe. <coughs> Some of you might know him. He has written quite a few books and he has wonderful tape recordings of his talking philosophy, which is very touching. And this was something I copied out of his book, Eternal Echoes. Just listen to this. Now, it's not soundbite English because it is from his Irish and the unusual kind of sometimes way he puts words together. But just listen to this. Ruins. Okay, this whole idea of mine, I love ruins. Temples of absence. The human heart longs to dwell. The root of the word dwelling includes the notion of lingering or delaying. It holds the recognition of our pilgrim nature, namely the suggestion that it will only be possible to linger for a while. From ancient times we have carved out dwelling places on the earth. Against the raw speed of nature, the dwelling always takes a particular intensity. It is a nest of warmth and intimacy. 
over years and generations, a larger aura of soul seeps into a dwelling and converts it in some way into a temple of presence. We leave our presence on whatever we touch and wherever we dwell. The presence can never... I'm going to start to cry because it's so much what I found and I think it is evident in this. This presence can never be revoked or wiped away. <clears throat> the aura endures. Presence leaves an imprint on the ether of a place. As the world gets older, it becomes ever more full with the ruins of vanished presence. This can be sensed years and years later, even more tangibly in the ruins of place. The ruin still holds the memory of the people who once inhabited it. When a ruin is an isolated presence in a field, and we've seen some of those pictures, it can insist on its personal signature of presence in contrast to the surrounding nature. A ruin is never simply empty. It remains a vivid temple of absence. All other inhabited dwellings hold their memory and their presence is continually added to and deepened by the seceding generations. It is consequently quite poignant that a long since vacated ruin still retains echoes of the presence of the vanished ones. An abandoned place is dense with the presence of the absent ones who have walked there. And I just think it is so important in this day and age when so much is being redone and scraped away. And in Georgia, I saw it everywhere. The scrape, I call it the scrape away, where the big bulldozers are coming in and just tearing down all the trees and bushes. You don't even know your landscape anymore. And then new things are being built. And just to have this kind of thing written, I think, reminds us of how much we need to enjoy and remember and hold dear these leftover places like the old Eel River Schoolhouse out there, you know, which was Charlie Pedrazzini's ranch, his family's ranch. They moved there from Switzerland. Honestly, to me, it's really just been a beautiful investment for me as a photographer. And I love to tell stories and draw correlations between different topics, you know, literature and what have you. So um, what do you think? Do you think that was a beautiful thing to hear? Absolutely. You know? Mm -hmm. Okay, we can turn on the lights now. And um, I'm glad we could squeeze as much into this as in, in yeah. one hour. But I want to, just so we turn on the lights, point out something here. You can see, I'm very stiff. Sorry, guys. Um, the actual look of these photographs, you know, with the light, they're not on the slides. But this was the camera that I used to make this one and the one of him with the children right here, the, the five by seven or four by five inch negatives. So go ahead and just take a look. And then in this notebook here is the um, exhibition itself with all the, no, okay. <laughs> this notebook, if, if you should get a glimpse of this, you mm -hmm. can, flip through and you'll see this is the way it looks when it's put into an exhibition. Yeah. You just turn mm -hmm. the pages and that was at the Morris Graves. So, and then the school books, the, all the still lifes of the school books are in here and um, various stories, um, the Rosenwald stories and such. And then up here are um, inside this cabinet here. Here's some of the actual memoirs, just little small ones. But here is something from Booker T. Washington. Here's his book, Up From Slavery, which is really worth reading, I'll tell you. This section is called Teaching School in a Stable and a Hen House. I confess that what I saw during my month of travel, this is from 1901, <coughs> an investigation left me with a very heavy heart. The work to be done to lift these people seemed to be almost beyond accomplishing. After consulting with the citizens of Tuskegee, this is Alabama. So this goes into when he began to think and philosophize about bringing education to the people there at that time and how utterly primitive it all is. Um, here's a, a book on the subject of the um, Hampton 
Institute where he went and got his education in Virginia. Here are the antique school books, the actual antique school books from the York schoolhouse, the log cabin, and then various other samples here of the canal school, the writing samples that are part of that archive, Charlie Pedrazzini's little miniature memoir. Anyway, you can just glance. I would suggest, though, if you like to read, I would suggest reading this book called The Whistling Season by Ivan Doig. Doig? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It's an absolutely captivating novel by a very highly regarded author who's now passed away, who wrote a lot of his novels around Montana subject matter. But this one is revolving around the people and the unusual circumstances of the teacher who came to rescue this one-room schoolhouse in Montana when the teacher, the official teacher, left. It's kind of a mystery, but it's a wonderful story. And this one, you, some of you have seen that series called Christy. Are we too old? Well, it's, you can look it up on the internet. The series of movies that became on, came on TV by this, about this girl, Christy, who was in Appalachia, in Tennessee. She wanted to be a teacher, and she went there. And this is the actual book, and it's based on real a real, um, the author's mother, I think. But it's very deeply touching. And um, this A Lesson Before Dying is another more contemporary, based on a story. Um, anyway, I don't think I should talk anymore. Do you want to say something? Absolutely. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much, Diana, for giving a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed having you here. For those of you who are still with us at home, we have an upcoming event here at the Clark on May 20th. It is going to be a Meet the Humble Historian where we're going to have tons of your favorite local authors who have written outstanding books over the years. They will be here in attendance to sign books and answer the great question of why write about Humboldt history. We hope to see you in attendance there. If you are a member of the Clark or the Humboldt County Historical Museum, you get a discount on admission. We hope to see you there. Once again, that's May 20th from 1 to 3 p.m. Tickets are available for purchase on the Clark Museum's website. Thank you again for tuning in to this most recent round of our Saturday speaker series. We hope to catch you next month. Thank you. Take care.